My name is Carrie Bourne. I am from the Office of Continuing Education here at UW-Whitewater, and we host the Fairhaven Lecture Series each semester um, and have been doing so since 1983. Um, this semester, we're taking the opportunity to showcase our new faculty on campus. So everybody you'll hear from this semester is newer to campus and to the Whitewater community. We have a lot of different, really interesting um, talks coming up this this spring, um, and this is our first one from the College of Education, a professor from the College of Education. I'll introduce her now. Courtney is an assistant professor of education at UW-Whitewater. She graduated in 2021 from the University of Kansas, where she received her PhD in special and inclusive education. Courtney was the recipient of a 2022 Outstanding Dissertation Award from the American Educational Research Association. Her work centers on educational equity, particularly for students with disability labels and their families as they move into adult service landscapes. Please welcome Dr. Courtney Wilt. So much, Kiri. Yes, there it is. There's the mic. Um, thank you for that introduction. It's so exciting to be here. Um, today is just such a fun and exciting ju juxtaposition in a way. I was just an hour ago in front of my class full of 35, 19, and 20 year olds, um, and I was telling them about this opportunity I had today to come speak with you all here at Fairhaven, um, and they were they were excited for me, and I was like, I'm going to bring back some of the things I learned from them, um, because I know y'all have y'all have some great insights into what I'm going to talk about with you today, and that is um, in related to my related to my dissertation, um, like Carrie was describing, um, that I just finished during COVID, and um, I was living in Kansas City. Um, no, I was living in Lawrence, Kansas. I lived in Kansas City. Lawrence, Kansas is where the university is about 45 minutes away from um, Kansas City. And um, those were some trying times, right? Um, I have four children, and so we were all at home together. Um, I had just twins who were two years old at the time. And so it's exciting to have been able to finish and land here in Whitewater, Wisconsin, um, and build my life here. So I'm, I'm really excited to be able to connect with y'all as part of the community. Um, just briefly, a little bit more about my background. So um, I graduated in 2006 from the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, and I grew up in Missouri. I then moved to Kansas City, which at the time was a big city life for me. I grew up in a really small town near Branson, Missouri. Um, and from there, I moved to teach internationally, and that was the first time I ever left the country uh, to move to Mexico City. Um, and I lived there for three years, and I taught at the American school there. And then I moved to the Czech Republic, and I taught uh, for one year in the Czech Republic. Before coming back, um, or during that time, I got my master's degree, and... Then I came back to Kansas City, and I was teaching in a, the local public schools in Kansas City, um, and some of that experience um, from my international work and then um, being back in Kansas City and thinking about some of the problems that I was seeing with special education and just educational equity in general um, fostered my desire to go back to school where I ended up getting my PhD in the University of Kansas. So I don't want to take too much time on that. I feel like we already kind of have limited time, but um, it's just great to be here. And I wanted to kind of situate myself as someone who is uh, building a life for my kids in Wisconsin and in Whitewater, actually. So um, one thing I wanted to do, um, oh, just lost the earring. That's okay. Is start out by kind of asking y'all um, some questions just to kind of think about in situating my work. So think, for your, think to yourself for a moment on this question one, and I do have them printed out. If you would like a copy of these questions to hold on to and look at and read, um, just raise your hand and I can pass you one out. Um, yes, great, thank you. But this first question is asking, what was your first paying job? You're welcome. Yeah. 
the first job that maybe you had that paid you. Do you want, do you want to answer? Well, yeah, I'll okay, answer. sure. My first paying job was a waitress. A waitress. Do you remember where? A little restaurant here in Whitewater, no longer here. Um, I worked there for a short time, uh, making 85 cents an hour. 85 cents an hour. Wow, that's that's great. Thank you for sharing because we're going to talk about the change in uh, minimum wage, actually. Has anybody else waitressing? Was their first job? Yeah, <laughs> Carrie in the back. <laughs> Um, so just take a second and maybe tell the person next to you and just share with them for a moment, what was your first paying job? Uh, babysitting counts. Yeah, yeah, why not? Babysitting, absolutely. Oh, yes. Okay, so if you shared maybe your first job, um, you know, then you can go on to think about how old were you when you left, when you left home? or moved away from your parent or your parents, whoever you were living with who raised you? You can share with each other. Yeah, we'll just take another minute. This is, this is really nice just to kind of share a little bit about ourselves. So the third question is around what were some common expectations of you and your peers after high school. And this might be different based on um, where you were living, uh, your gender, right? So um, let's, let's do this quick question for maybe 30 seconds share. You know, what were some common expectations for young people um, and your peers and yourself perhaps when you left high school? We're going to kind of juxtapose some of these answers, and I know maybe some of them are kind of still ruminating in your minds, um, but I just want to kind of situate that for, you know, the, today's current kind of context and the expectations that young people um, are dealing with. So let me show you a little bit of data. First of all, in 1968, the minimum wage was $1.60. Um, perhaps your first job maybe was before this date. Um, or around this time, but today the uh, that would be about eleven dollars and seventy six cents. And when we look at inflation, and the minimum wage in Wisconsin, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is seven dollars and twenty five cents. So um, really, you know, it doesn't necessarily go as far, right? Um, and we can look at that in. Um, connection with this data about young people 18 to 29 years old, more than half um, are living with a parent or a family member currently, which, which may be quite different from how you experienced um, growing up and leaving home and some of those expectations. Um, you know, perhaps not. We see a rise in this from pre-pandemic uh, to now. Although even back in 2019, you know, it was still almost half of young people in that age group. And we can think about some of the economic reasons why uh, young people might choose to continue to live at home longer. Um, and then the last one I want to show you is just around this educational attainment um, expectations kind of idea. So if we are looking at um, let me see if I'm reading this correctly. In the blue at the top, um, high school graduate or more. So we're up to about 91.1% in like 2021. Um, and in 1960, that was at about 41%. So that's really grown, this rate of high school graduation. Um, and then if we look at the college graduate or more, it's also on an increase, and now we're looking at college graduate or more is about 37.5%, and that would also differ by um, you know, geographic area of the United States and things like that as well. Um, but I, I wanted to also put this up. I heard, you know, I didn't break it down by gender, but that would also be something interesting, right? We have so many more women attending college, um, in some places outnumbering men and outperforming men um, in a lot of fields as well. So that is a change, right? Um, and I just want to situate that because I want to 
be able to talk about my dissertation with this knowledge that things are sh things are shifting, and I want to have a historical perspective um, that y'all bring. So you could you could totally school me on some of this stuff, um, and I wish we had more time, but. Um, I want to go ahead and move a little bit forward, thinking about free and appropriate education, um, kind of the basis of some of our education laws, um, specifically IDEA, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, and that's our special education law, um, if you're not familiar with IDEA. We have some of these founding principles, right, that our nation values around equal opportunity and full participation, um, independent living, right? But when we think about that in co the context of how many young people live with their families, perhaps um, teaching young students with disabilities independent living skills might not be quite as relevant um, as it used to be. I don't know. Um, and then economic self-sufficiency. Now, what we're seeing though, which is probably not surprising, is that young people and students with disabilities are less likely to enroll in college or post-secondary education. Um, they experience lower employment rates, lower wages, um, less opportunities for advancement in their jobs, uh, less likely to live independently or have a lot of choice and self you know, self-determination around what they choose. Um, and that also varies by disability label. So that's important because the study I'm gonna talk about is um, students who were labeled with intellectual disability. And um, the, that kind of subset of people with disabilities in schools um, tend to be more highly segregated and offered less choice. And, and we're gonna talk about the parameters of that and how it's also shaped by not just ableism, but racism. Okay, so students who have disabilities who are afforded community-based work settings in high school are more likely to get a paid job. If they're not in the community during high school and they're doing like cleaning the floors or um, washing the windows, that does not mean that they're more likely to get a job after high school. Um, that's kind of a misconception we might have. Another thing is that if students are fortunate enough to be enrolled in a post-secondary education program, maybe for, for students with disabilities, we have one here in Whitewater and it's really amazing. Um, those students are actually more, 15 more li times more likely to get a paid job after that opportunity. Um, so access to post-secondary education can be really life altering for students with intellectual disability specifically. Um, some schools may give alternate diplomas or certificates for students with intellectual disability rather than a real um, diploma, right? And sometimes families are not aware that if a child is not getting a regular diploma, um, they're excluded from particular job opportunities. Many employers require a high school diploma right, not a certificate. And this, this is significant because it might seem like, well, that's just really objective, right? Either they can earn a diploma or they can't. But in reality, there's a big variation between states and cities around how likely they are to give alternative diplomas versus um, supporting students with intellectual disability to earn regular diplomas. Um, and that can be really consequential and add to inequitable employment, right? Um, let's look at some of these issues when we add in, you know, that kind of that component of race. So of youth with disabilities after high school, 35% of African American respondents are um, report being employed as compared to 54% of Hispanic and 64% of white students. Um, so sometimes we, uh, raise your hand if you were at um, Dr. Olivia's, I can't remember her last name, uh, she spoke last week, and she was talking about black feminism. Yeah, some of you, okay, it was so great. Um, and 
and sometimes we, we think about disability on this single axis, oh, 64% of white students are not um, experiencing employment. That's pretty low, right? But we don't wanna ignore the fact that it's almost half that for African-American students. Um, so we wanna, we wanna be able to be intersectional and look at our data in multiple ways. Um, more than that, even, when we look at job satisfaction, right? Because people deserve to enjoy their jobs and feel respected and valued in the work that they do. Um, African-American uh, uh, people with disabilities who are employed are less likely to um, you know, enjoy, their, enjoy their jobs and feel satisfied in those roles. Um, another thing that I, th I thought y'all might find interesting is that um, Youth with disabilities who reported being employed in 2010 was down from 1990 across all three racial categories. So we're not necessarily like crushing it in the field of special education, are we? Um, unfortunately, and there's lots of progress that's been made in the field of special education. Um, it's a field that has really bloom during your lifetime, right, with advancements in disability law and disability rights, along with civil rights. Um, but if we look at some of these things, it's still kind of, uh, kind of downcast, right? Like, oh, we're not really meeting the goals that we have for us. So just a few key points. Inclusive transition education, um, it can prepare youth. Yeah. You know what, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead because I think we talked about this and I wanna get to my study. Um, one quick note on families. Family participation is a huge issue, right? Um, it's, it's demanded by the law now that families are involved. And sometimes we conceptualize it as going to school activities or volunteering. And in the society that we live in, many families um, aren't able to do that. They're not able to participate in these really normalized ways that we celebrate. Um, and families of color are often, um, you know, disregarded their expertise as family members um, and likely to be ignored or perceived as aggressive or intimidating. Um, and these are racialized stereotypes about black families and black parents. Um, and so when we put kind of this together, that kind of sets the stage for this quick study I'm gonna talk about, and that is my dissertation study. So um, this particular um, dissertation is surrounding um, something really personal to me because my participants were 18, 19, 20 years old, and they were actually my students in 2006. So I did this study in 2019 and 2020. And back in 2006, remember, I'm in my circle, and I started out in Kansas City. Um, those were my students in that first class that I had. I was really fortunate to still be connected with some of those families. Um, I still am to this day, right? And they were so gracious to volunteer to be participants in my study, not just them, I think I'm gonna stand up on this stage, um, Kiara, Deshaun, and Savannah, and they were three black young adults with intellectual disability labels that they had had since they entered my kindergarten classroom in 2006. Um, as their teacher, and then they each had um, two family members that participated as well. So they all were involved in interviews. Um, and I'm not gonna get into some of the methods because let's just, we don't need to take that time. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about that with you later. Um, I just want to you know, move forward a little bit to our findings. So I think that Dr. Olivia even was describing some of these things when she was speaking with y'all last week around Okay, we have an overrepresentation of black students in special education, an underrepresentation of them in gifted education, right? And these are racialized things. They, they show how racism and ableism kind of collude um, to lead to exclusionary experiences. Um, 
and this, this impacts discipline as well. But for my study, um, I want to, I, a lot of times we talk a lot about discipline and exclusionary discipline for black students, but the students in my study were not hyper-disciplined, but they were hyper-surveilled in other ways. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that the conversation um, that I'm contributing is not just relying on ideas about behavior and discipline, but other ways that black students with disabilities who may be less likely to be perceived as like problems behaviorally um, are being excluded. So these are for some of my data sources. And then my theoretical orientation, I'm not gonna spend much time on this as well, but um, yes, it, it recognizes how racism and ableism intertwine. Um, I look at spatial features as well in schools, what spaces do, do did students ex um, inhabit during their school experiences, and the funds of knowledge is really important in situating that families are the experts and they have knowledge to share and they are sources of knowledge generation, uh, not me as, you know, who I am. I actually had a lot of humbling experiences doing this dissertation rather than I'm going to tell them something, right? Um, okay. I feel like I'm speaking really fast, so I'm going to slow down just a little bit. Um, but basically, my findings overall highlighted an organized disinvestment in black youth um, and their educational resources. So, Put, putting their educational resources as dispensable, right? Or as, as resources that could be reallocated to other students who may be um, framed as more deserving or more worthy for those limited ideas of limited resources. The school district that I'm talking about was an urban school district and it did not, it did have funding issues, right? Um, which is not, com not uncommon for students or for school districts where we see high populations of black and minoritized students. Um, I'm gonna focus on just one finding and that is thinking about pre-employment transition services. So when I had you thinking about your first experiences in employment, um, you know, I, I really wanna situate that our ex employment experiences are kind of, um, you know, personal, they lead to other opportunities in our lives, they, they're memorable. Um, they're relational um, as well. And I want to look at um, this idea of pre-employment transition because by law, fam uh, students with disabilities should be set up for success in employment. Um, we know that doesn't really necessarily happen, um, but I wanted to look at it from the experiences of these black students with intellectual disability labels. And what I found that... Um, there were three kind of ways to describe this that were that happening for my three participants, Kiara, Savannah, and Deshaun, right? And I'm gonna go through each one. So first, let me introduce a word to you. This word is misogynoir, and this is a term coined by Dr. Moya Bailey in 2010, and it supports the articulation of the ways that black women experience both misogyny or sexism and anti-black anti -black racism. So if you were at Dr. Olivia's talk, we were talk she was talking about black feminism um, and the ways that racism and sexism shape the experiences of um, black women. Now for Kiara, who was a young woman, um, in the classroom she was really positioned as a helper. So she was like helping other students. Um, her mom, Lynn, I oh, know Lynn was, I think, her aunt. Um, she said, I noticed for her particularly, just listening to my sister, she, Kiara, became more like the helper. Like when she was in the sixth grade and helping because she's the one that can help, I imagine she was doing a lot of that rather than learning. And then I want to contextualize this a little bit more. So her aunt, her mom, Trinity, was saying she'll give peers her lunch money. Those things happened a lot. She would give away her stuff. So it could have been even homework. I don't know, but I know money, lunches. That was a big problem. I don't know. It was like, aren't you guys paying attention? Um, and so I, I, I kind of made this theme around 
overlooked and unprotected in certain ways, um, but really valued in, in other ways as far as helping the teacher. Now, most of the teachers in their experiences looked a lot like me. They were white women, right? Most of our teaching forces, it continues to be majority white women, even though um, our student population is really diversifying. And so um, to a large degree, a lot of these um, activities around helping were helping uh, white women, and that was kind of the way she was positioned, not as a learner, but as a helper. And if that would happen to my own children, right, I might have a problem with that, right? Uh, they're not just there to help other students, they're there to learn. Um, so another thing that happened is that she took a lot of cooking and cleaning classes. Um, and this, this is actually an interesting topic for y'all because um, courses such as home economics and those kinds of things are not as common as they used to be um, in like general education curriculums. Some schools kind of have phased them out or they call them by a different name. But um, students with dis disabilities, particularly intellectual disability, are more likely to have um, coursework that really focuses on those kinds of things in the name of independent living and stuff like that. Um, and so there, there's really nothing wrong with that inherently, but remember, this was a lot of her time in school when she wasn't doing reading or math, but she was doing, um, you know, cooking. And so her mom says, that's all they work on those things, cooking and cleaning, you know what I mean? You're not learning no history, you're not learning about science, not this. Um, so Trinity was aware of that. These mom, mom knows, right? Um, but she was unsuccessful in getting the school to like um, expand Kiara's access to history, um, you know, as a young black girl learning about uh, black history even, right? So some of these conversations might have been happening in more general education spaces, and that was not necessarily something that Kiara had access to. Okay. I think I'm okay on time, actually. So I want to move into, that was kind of Kiara's like story, right? Now I want to move into Deshaun. Deshaun was my um, male participant. He, he had um, parents who were deaf and hard of hearing. And when he entered school, he didn't have some of the same verbal language. His first language was actually sign language, it was ASL. Um, and he was still learning ASL and he was learning English, um, but it was, it was a confusing time for him, right? As a young five-year-old, he actually ended up being diagnosed or labeled with an intellectual disability pretty early on. Um, and we don't have time to get into some of the maybe potential problems with how valid that label was, but it's a hard label to shake. And it's a hard label to shake, right? So Deshaun was labeled with intellectual disability. His first language is ASL. Um, both of his parents, that was their home language. Now, when I was talking about behavior before, we know, beha we know that black boys are really, in particular, vulnerable to exclusionary behavior practices. So one thing that Deshaun did um, that was really intelligent um, is that he kind of was really compliant to protect himself from being further excluded due to behavior. So he was really good, okay? He was really good. He wanted to do good. He wanted to help everyone and the teachers to like him. And gosh, they did, right? But he was still excluded. Um, he said, in middle school, I was always in one class, and since they want to change it up, since they know I'm pretty good in class and know what I'm doing, they tried to switch it up and put me in a general education course. So he was trying to be so good that then he could earn the right to leave the segregated special education classroom and go into a general education class with his same age peers who were not um, you know, segregated based on disability. Um, practices of goodness, if you will. The other thing that was really interesting about Deshaun is that he spent a lot of time, I'm going back to this picture because he drew this image. This is, this is him in elementary school. Um, 
where he met me, right, in kindergarten. And then this is his middle school and his high school. Now you'll see him doing something here. He's actually selling coffee at the school coffee shop um, in middle school and in high school. And he talks about it quite a bit in my interviews with him about his experience working at the school coffee shop. And he said, I actually wanted to help out and do lots of work. I did lots of work and help to make sure like I don't mess up the orders make sure they get it right. And that's why I went in the hallway with this picture, holding coffee, make sure it smells good, right? So Deshaun had so much pride in his work and he was good at it. Um, but the thing that I wanna highlight to y'all is that um, working in a coffee shop was not his end goal when he left high school. He didn't want to work at coffee shop probably because he'd been doing it for six years. Um, and he didn't, he, he didn't have other opportunities to explore other um, maybe options, right? So he said, I have my different goals to do something else instead of working at a coffee shop. But yet he really was so proud. Um, and uh, I don't think I have it on the slide, but he, I did the math because he did at least two hours of his seven hour schedule over his whole time in high school. I'm not quite sure about how much time he spent in middle school, but it was something really pretty outrageous, like 30 something percent of his time in high school was spent serving other people at the coffee shop. And again, many of the clientele were um, white women, right? So this is service to white people, white women, um, and that was kind of what he was trained to do um, <clears throat> during school. Okay, and then the last one I'm gonna talk about is Savannah. Savannah had really complex communication support needs. She didn't have a lot of speech. Um, and so a lot of the data that I got for Savannah was through her mother. Um, her mother was named Joelle, and she was talking about this misalignment between what's supposed to be happening for transition planning and, um, you know, Savannah's experience. So she says if they, and she means the teachers, if they could have tried to figure out, even try and include some of her friends so that she didn't feel it was just her, but that didn't happen. The first step was, well, we tried it and that didn't work and they were done. This is Joelle advocating for her to be in a um, choir class, just an entry level high school freshman choir class um, because Savannah really liked music and she could kind of hum and sing along. Um, that was deemed inappropriate for Savannah by the teachers and Joelle was unable to advocate for her to be uh, given access to that, um, <clears throat> which is pretty significant because um, Joelle was a school professional herself. So when I talk about these families, I, I'm definitely, I didn't talk about um, their economic status, but that's kind of intentional because I don't want to conflate um, classism and racism, right? So sometimes even with my students, when I talk about um, you know, black family or something, they might have it in their brains that I'm, just, I'm talking about people who um, experience economic injustice or poverty. And, and many times uh, black families do because they've been maybe denied um, <clears throat> you know, wealth in certain ways. But I'm not necessarily talking about that. So this is someone who has a school professional, she has a degree in special education, um, all of these things, and still unable to advocate for a little bit more inclusive experience for her daughter in high school. Um, and then I really, what time is it, 3.37? I went a little faster than I expected. Um, so I can, I can go on and talk about uh, Rocky Foundations for just a minute, um, and then we'll have some time for questions. But all of the students, Kiara, Deshaun, and Savannah, were um, experiencing this high school transition on a rocky foundation. And what I mean by that is that some of the supports that they should have 
received in you know elementary school and things were necessarily were not necessarily there. So Kiara was not given um, high quality literacy instruction. Um, that's that's all too common, right? Foundational literacy skills. If we look at um, you know our reading scores, we have a lot of work to do in the area of reading and literacy. And for Black intellectually disabled students, um, they might even be further away from accessing some of those um, high, really high quality supports. Language and communication supports. Deshaun, remember Deshaun was um, uh, he was bilingual, but his bilingual Ness was kind of discounted and deemed as a deficiency because his English was was not where his peers were, um, and so he had a lot of speech and language path, um, therapy. He did, but a lot of that was really clinical. Like he would go to, you know, the speech and language pathologist's office by himself, and he kind of internalized this idea that he really wasn't good at talking, um, which is really not true, right? That, that path set him up for these kind of beliefs that he wasn't good at certain things. Um, and then same for Savannah, her, her related services were removed from her IEP, the document that's supposed to you know, protect her. Um, they would actually remove some of these services like physical therapy, occupational therapy. Um, Y'all might be familiar with some of these things. They were kind of removed from her um, IEP because they said that she wouldn't make progress. She can't make progress, almost like it's not worth our time and resources anymore, um, which is unlawful, actually. Um, but again, that was, that was something that her family had to battle against. Now, one thing I will end on, since I have a, a minute, is, um, you know, sometimes I present some of this stuff and it's like, Oh, this is really kind of depressing. And it is actually uh, kind of sad, but I don't want to discount the forms of resistance that families you know, expressed and their joy and their happiness. Um, they had a lot of funds of knowledge, support, identity within their families. They had a premise of inclusivity um, often where it's not necessarily talking about disability, but um, there's, there's almost the need not the need to talk about the disability because everybody's just included and you provide the supports when they're needed, um, right? And so in schools, we, we have a big categorical approach where we um, divvy out resources based on particular disabilities, um, unfortunately, rather than a premise or an understanding that everybody's included from the get-go. Um, and then I just want to end that Fox Run, the small community that was in the urban setting that I did this study on, um, is a community of a lot of perseverance, a lot of hope. Um, big Chiefs fans right now, I'll say that. I'm sure they're all wearing their red and yellow. Um, and it, it, it gives me a lot of um, pride to be able to share stories from that particular community because it means so much to me. And um, yeah, so I'll end with that. Thank you so much. <laughs>